you for including me. In this presentation, I will introduce the Israeli electoral system as a model for Canadian electoral reform. There's been much discussion in Canada lately about the possibility of moving to an electoral system based on proportional representation, or PR. And this idea has come mostly out of the Green Party, which has a lot to benefit from this kind of electoral change. So, uh, let's see. yeah. What we have now, of course, is a plurality system in which the winner of any constituency simply needs more votes than any other candidates to win the seat. In other words, uh, the winner doesn't need a majority of the votes, which would be 50% plus one. So if there's a situation in which you have party A with 10% of the vote, party B with 20% of the vote, party C with 30%, party D with 31%, of course, in a majority plurality system, party C would be the official opposition and party D would be the government. So party D wins it all and becomes the government even though party D did not get a majority of the votes. In fact, more people voted against party D, 60% uh, then voted for it. Uh, so that, that I see as a problem. By contrast, proportional representation is an electoral system where parties get seats in a legislature in proportion to the number of votes they receive from the electorate. So in the same scenario, but using PR, party A with 10% of the votes would get 10% of, of the seats in parliament, party B would get 20% of the votes translated to 20% of seats and, and so on. So in a PR system, no one party has to obtain a majority to, to ensure that votes to, to sit in parliament and have influence over politics. The primary purpose of this electoral strategy is to ensure that votes are translated as closely as possible into seats in parliament. And the belief is that proportional representation encourages smaller parties with more focused platforms. Why? Because when you get rid of the winner-take-all scenario, uh, voters would be able to throw their support behind the, the parties that they want, and they, they could then support, support smaller parties with the confidence that their votes wouldn't be wasted. So I wanted to contribute my knowledge about Israeli elections to this conference because the Israeli electoral system uses proportional representation and has now over 60 years of experience with this type of system, both in terms of its advantages and disadvantages. And Israel is a useful case study, both to understand proportional representation in general, but also to understand the implications for a country like Canada that's thinking potentially about going in that direction. So Israel has an electoral system that's based on nationwide proportional representation in the Israeli Knesset, which is the Israeli unicameral parliament. It has 120 seats. Israeli elections are direct, which means that electors vote directly for the Knesset uh, rather than through some kind of electoral college. Uh, in 1996, Israel briefly experimented with direct election of the Prime Minister, which meant that they held one ballot for the Knesset, which was a vote for a party, and a separate ballot for the very first time in its history for the Prime Minister. And the purpose of this reform was to empower the larger parties, uh, and in so doing, try to strengthen the ruling coalition and the stability of the government, because that was becoming a real problem with governments falling all the time. But it didn't work the way that the reformers had in mind because voters cast their ballots instead for smaller parties that better represented their political views at the expense of the day's larger parties. And then they voted for whichever prime minister they wanted. So they dropped this two ballot system in 2001 and since then it's been uh, uh, one ballot. Now Israel uses a closed list system, which means that the electorate votes for party lists that have already been determined uh, by the parties in their primaries. So uh, the, the parties offer lists from one to how many candidates they want to run, and you cannot change the list, which is the case in other countries. So the number of seats that every party list receives in the Knesset is proportional to the number of votes uh, of 
voters who voted for it. So if a party gets 10 seats and has a list of, say, 14 candidates, then the first 10 of those 14 candidates will get their seats. The only limitation is the qualifying threshold, which is the minimum share of the vote that every party needs to secure any representation at all. And the electoral threshold in Israel has continuously been raised, which is interesting. In 1988, it was 1%. So in other words, a party list needs 1% to be able to run in elections. It went up to 1.5% and then 2% in 2003. And then in March 2014, the Knesset improved an even higher threshold of 3.25%, which is what it is now, which translates to approximately four seats. So Israel is a relatively young state, and it's known for political diversity along many lines, ideological, ethnic, religious. Golda Meir, the former Israeli prime minister, once told Richard Nixon, you're the president of 150 million Americans, but I'm the prime minister of six million prime ministers. And I think there's something to this in a country that has a great diversity of political opinions. Uh, in Israel, it's because of the ongoing Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, Israelis are naturally more interested in politics because their security is at stake, not just their national security, but their personal security. And this impacts all areas of life, economics, society, religion. But the question in Israel, and it's a question to think about in any democracy, is how to balance stability and representation. So um, I just want to mention a few other things, and then I will get to the implications. There's an additional limitation on the Israeli electoral system, which is the prevention of any party from running a list in the Knesset elections that promotes one or more of the following attributes. Uh, so they cannot, one, negate the state of Israel as the state of the Jewish people. They cannot negate the democratic nature of the state. They cannot incite to racism. And they cannot support armed struggle against the state of Israel. So this is applied to both radical Arab Muslim parties as well as radical Jewish uh, religious parties like the Kah and the Kahanahai parties, which were extreme right-wing parties on the, uh, the, the, on the religious uh, spectrum, but also nationalist. And at one point in Israeli history, they were banned outright because they incited violence against Arabs and Muslims in Israel. So, um, and this was very serious. Many of the leaders were arrested and put under administrative detention in, in, for a time in Israel. So with this brief synopsis of Israeli elections in mind, I'll proceed by talking about the advantages and disadvantages of the PR system in Israel for, for Canada. Slide five. Oh, I don't have a slide. So the first advantage is it, it, it promotes democracy. Uh, the PR system uh, promotes civic participation and suffrage because voters can feel comfortable that they can support the party uh, of, their, of their interests and they can be very specific interests. So Israeli, elect, elector, uh, Israeli voters do not have to vote strategically, which is a problem in Canada. In the last Israeli elections in 2015, there were 25 parties that ran, and they represented a great diversity of political opinions and, and issues. They ranged from the more entrenched parties, like the Likud party, which is center-right, and the Zionist Union, which is basically the Labour party, which is center-left, and the Joint List, which is an amalgamation of four Arab parties. And to the more whimsical parties like the Israeli, uh, or the Pirate Party of Israel and the Flower Party. So there was a great range of different parties and issues. And Israeli parties also represent um, many different groups in Israel. They represent Jews, both secular and religious. Uh, they represent Ashkenazi Jews, which are Jews from European descent. There are parties that represent Sephardi Jews, which are Jews from Arab and North African countries. Uh, 
parties represent Arabs, Muslims, even Islamic fundamentalists, uh, middle and working class, Russians, because there's a gr very large Russian immigrant community that it itself has split into two parties, left and right, and many attitudes within those parties towards foreign policy and the Palestinians. And in all, the diversity of the party system has generated very high voter turnouts. Uh, the voter turnout, that is of registered voters in 2015, was 72.36%, which if you know anything about voter turnout, you'd know is very high. So if you compare that to the voter turnout in Canada, in our national elections in the same year, it was 685 it's more, and that was high in Canada compared to previous years. So the electoral system in Israel promotes a very active, engaged uh, electorate. Another advantage of PR system in Israel is that there is no gerrymandering. Uh, Israel's election, so gerry, well, the Israeli electoral system is based on nationwide proportional representation, which means that the whole country is one constituency. So this doesn't leave room for gerrymandering, which, which means to manipulate the boundaries of electoral districts to favor one party or another. So the absence of gerrymandering is also an, a, a way that promotes democracy because um, it, it doesn't have that incentive to, to ch I would say, cheat. And although you don't, the problem with this is that you don't have proximity of voters to local MPs. There are no local constituencies. The disadvantages, of course, are number one, stalemate. On account of the diversity of opinion, which is represented in the diversity of the party system, um, Israeli governments tend to fall before the four-year period from which they're supposed to, um, to, to, to live. So, the reason the government falls is often because of a vote of no confidence. And what happens is one or two small parties will leave the government over some political dispute that is particular to their interests. And so you can have a government fall uh, as a result of one political party leaving that doesn't even have that many seats. And that leads to another problem. And the problem is coalition bargaining. In spite of the diversity of the party system, until recently, only two parties have dominated the Israeli uh, political system. That's Likud on the right and Labor on the left. Is that three minutes? OK. Uh, to date, no political party has ever earned uh, a majority of the seats. Uh, there's never been such a party. Um, so all Israeli governments have been coalition governments all the way back since 1948. And those parties that remain outside of the government make up the coalition. So the problem is that there's, the day after the elections, there's a lot of secret backroom dealings. And the larger parties have to pander to the interests of smaller parties. And so during the coalition bargaining, which is behind the scenes, the larger coalition building parties will have to make promises to smaller parties that sometimes negate the promises that they just made in the electoral campaign. And as a result of this, small parties in Israel uh, have a disproportionately large influence. And these are called swing parties because they, they, they have their own particularist agendas and they represent the interests of their members, which are ethnically or religiously based something more like trade unions than parties. Um, and they're pragmatic politically and very flexible, so they'll just join any coalition that will have them. And there are two such parties in Israel, Shas, which is a, an orthodox uh, Sephardi Jewish party, which basically is interested, for the most part, in public funding for its own schools and public services and synagogues. And the other one is, is Israel Beteinu, which is Israel is our home, which is a secular right-wing nationalist party that for the most part supports Russians and their communities. So in coalition bargaining scenarios, these parties become kingmakers because they can throw their support behind any uh, coalition. And sometimes after elections, they make really wild demands, as was the case in 2008 when uh, all of a sudden, Shas called for 
increased social welfare, which was fine, but all of a sudden they came up with the demand for the territorial preservation of Jerusalem, which went against the left-wing coalition's ideals. And um, Kadima party head, which was the, the larger party that was negotiating at the time, the head, C.P. Levney, said, quote, I'm not willing to be blackmailed. So these are the kinds of pros and cons that you'll find with a PR system, as is the case in Israel, which has much experience with this kind of issues. And um, Israel knows all too well the kinds of drawbacks that you have working through such a system. Um, but in any case, I think it's something to think about in the debates about electoral reform in Canada. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I, it's obviously something that I've been thinking about and some parties in Canada have been thinking about as well. And I think that it would be a very good system for Canada because for the longest time we've had political parties that are represented in the House of Commons disproportionately to the, uh, the strength that they, that they earned in the, in, the, in the elections. And I think that um, if we had uh, more representation for parties that are either smaller or that are spread out throughout the country and then don't have strength to catch any one particular constituency, I think that that would make our electoral system more diverse and democratic and would allow for uh, voters to, 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 to vote for the political party that best represents them and to, that it, it would put less pressure on the larger catch-all parties to, to try and be so inclusive that they have to dilute their ideological message. So in other words, I think that it, it's a way to, to bring political opinions back into the Canadian political system, which I guess sounds a little bit peculiar, but I think that we don't have enough politics in, in Canadian electoral, in the Canadian electoral system nationally. So I think it would be very good. It would allow for parties like the Green Party um, and smaller parties of whatever stripe to be represented in proportion to the support that they have in Canada. That's, that's a, a great set of questions um, because it, it, it pertains to the manner in which Israeli politics is, is, is now represented. Um, so coalitions it, it have become much more diverse. Today, I, I was just doing a tally, today there's 11 parties represented in the Knesset. And over time, the larger parties have somewhat disintegrated. So in Israel, there, uh, there were two parties that were in office for almost all of Israeli history. The Labour Party was in office from uh, before the establishment of the State of Israel in 48, all the way up to 1977. So it was really one party with a few other parties, uh, but, but labor was very strong. It was much larger than, to, I mean, the labor party split up today. There are pretty much two labor parties. And so from 1977 onward, the Likud party was in power, and it was also very strong. So over the last few decades, the larger parties have uh, disintegrated into smaller parties, and that has actually, in my opinion, been good for the representation of the Israeli electorate because uh, th there are more avenues for expression within the, the blocks of parties. But I think that it, in, in Canada, you asked about, well, I'll just say. Right, right. Um, uh, well, the Likud government is, uh, has been much more stable <laughs> in, in the last few, the, the Likud government has, has been in office since 96 with a brief interlude of Labour Party rule, um, but they've been actually quite stable. Um, but I think that they've been stable because the Likud party has broken up a bit so that those people that want to be represented by secular versus orthodox or nationalist versus center have have their place in the coalition. So it's, I think it's actually been a good thing. And, and we have to see now from 2015 onward to see if the government's going to last. But so far, it seems that it, it, it will. Thank you. <laughs>